Hello, everyone. Myself, Alexandra, Lisa, Brittany, and Santi would like to thank you for joining us. Hopefully, you enjoyed this presentation as we introduced the humanistic theory and the top five interventions that can be used with individuals who are suffering from depression. Depression is a widely known and well-recognized mental health condition that can affect an individual on many different levels. Uh, the presence of sadness, emptiness, and irritable mood, change in appetite and sleep, uh, loss of interest in pleasurable activities and energy are all uh, signs of depression, and it significantly affects the individual's capacity to function. An article from Harvard Medical School suggests that depression is caused by chemical imbalance and that the issue is much more complex than just stressful life events. Uh, the areas of the brain that play a serious role in depression are the amygdala, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. And an fMRI study showed that the hippocampus is actually smaller in depressed individuals. Uh, Harvard Medical School also uh, suggests that genetics can play a role in depression and that there is a 1.5 to 3% more chance of an increase for an individual who has a first degree relative who, who suffered from uh, major depression. Every part of the human body, including the brain, is controlled by genes. Uh, genes make proteins that are involved in biological processes, and throughout life, different genes turn on and off so that they can make the right proteins at the right time. But if the genes get it wrong, they can alter a person's biology in a way that results in mood becoming unstable. In a person who is genetically vulnerable to depression, any stress can then push the system off balance. Uh, early losses and trauma can also cause depression. To introduce a little bit about the population, our group was interested in looking at depression in adults in general and working towards that population and making a connection with the humanistic approach. Uh, going based off of that, on this slide here, you are presented with statistics and information on demographics for adults with depression in the United States. The data was pulled out of the National Institute of Mental Health website, where the 2017 data collection was completed by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. As you can see here, a little over 17 million adults in the U.S., had at least one major depressive episode in 2017, and 11 million had severe impairment. Data shows that depression is higher in females than in males, with somewhere around a 3.4% difference. The data shows that the age range of the number of individuals with depression mentioned above was between 18 to 25 years old, and 65% uh, received medication and therapy combined treatment, 6% was medication treatment only, and 35% was no treatment at all. So what is the connection between humanistic theory and depression? How can humanistic interventions help an individual with depression? The humanistic approach to therapy is about self-actualization and self-awareness and helping the individual reach their maximum potential. Although research is kind of limited when it comes to humanistic uh, interventions and its effectiveness on depression, there is always room to grow, ask questions, and expand research-based research data. Included on this slide are a few evidence-based research studies that show reduction in depressive symptoms after participants were exposed to humanistic therapy interventions. The top five interventions to the humanistic theory that our group has chosen are motivational interviewing, gestalt therapy, person-centered therapy, also known as client-centered therapy, transactional analysis, and existential therapy. Motivational interviewing is a directive client-centered counseling approach for prompting behavior change by helping clients to explore and resolve ambivalence. It is a method that helps people work through ambivalent feelings and insecurities related to making positive changes and assist them with finding the internal motivation they need to change their behavior. Motivational interviewing has been found to improve depressive symptoms in individuals who experience them as reported by various clinical trials. Five of the central principles of motivational interviewing can be described through the acronym DEARS, which stands for Develop Discrepancy, Express Empathy, Amplify Ambivalence, Roll with Resistance, and Support Self-Efficacy. These principles support the ethical values of self-determination, dignity and worth of the person, and autonomy. 
The main task involved with developing discrepancy is to help focus the individual's attention to how their current behavior differs from their ideal behavior. The goal is for the individual to recognize and elevate the importance of change in their own life. An individual is more likely to change their behavior if they can see the conflict between their current behavior, personal goals, and their values. Some of the techniques involved with developing discrepancy include using change talk and decisional balancing. Change talk includes conversations about the person's level of desire to change, personal perceptions of their ability to change, and their motivation to change. The decisional balance is a method used for determining pros and cons of different choices. It involves asking questions like, what is good about the behavior? And what is not enjoyable about the behavior? Expressing empathy refers to attempting to experience what the person is experiencing. This is an important part of motivational interviewing, as it's not possible to change the person, but it is possible to create an empathetic environment where the person can be more likely to move toward change. Motivational interviewing relies on asking open-ended questions and using active and reflective listening. It's important to have an attitude of acceptance and striving to make that individual feel heard. Amplifying ambivalence is closely related to the principle of developing discrepancy as it involves the individual considering their ambivalence to change and exploring the two options they're dealing with, to change or not to change. This involves asking the individual to consider things like how the behavior has been a problem in their lives, what their life was like prior to the problem starting, and what they think their life might be like in the future if they don't make any changes. Resistance is a normal reaction for individuals who are considering making changes. Rather than arguing against the resistance or pushing back, rolling with that resistance and skillfully working to elicit the individual's own motivation to change are very effective techniques. Rolling with resistance statements can sound like, it's okay if you don't want to change, it's your choice, or you're right, this is really challenging to do all at once, and asking questions like, where do you want to go from here? Even when someone is committed to making a change, the individual can be frustrated by a lack of confidence about their ability to achieve the change. The goal is to increase the individual's confidence, which helps to enhance self-efficacy, the person's belief that they can achieve their goal. This is done by allowing the individual to have responsibility for their own decisions and helping the individual reframe towards a more positive view of success. It's important to help instill hope in the individual's ability to change, highlight skills they have already developed, and explore potential barriers to change. This could include questions and statements like, it sounds like you have made real progress. How does that make you feel? Or, if you were totally successful and things worked out perfectly, what would be different? The Gestalt approach views people as connected to and influenced by the environment around them. It also views people as generally good and as being capable of choosing to move towards growth and balance. The goal of Gestalt therapy is to teach people to become aware of significant sensations within themselves and their environment so that they respond reasonably to those situations. Gestalt therapy focuses on the integration between the whole person and his or her environment. An important function of this approach is paying attention to the individual's body language, such as the posture, gestures, and voice, as this is considered to be reflective of what the client is going through. Gestalt therapy is an effective approach to use for individuals who are experiencing depressive symptoms. Research indicates that this approach has been a successful method for treatment of mental health issues, specifically anxiety and depression. Mental health providers who approach therapy from this framework also use other techniques, such as confrontation and role-playing, to enhance the focus on current struggles and increase personal self-awareness. The following are key concepts of Gestalt therapy that are typically used with individuals who have depressive symptoms. Wholeness and integration. This refers to the whole person rather than their separate parts. Integration refers to how these parts fit together and how the individual integrates into their environment. Awareness. In Gestalt therapy, awareness is considered a hallmark of the healthy person and a goal of treatment. When individuals are aware, they are able to self-regulate in their environment. Two main causes for lacking awareness are preoccupation with the past and low self-esteem. Energy and blocks to energy. Block energy refers to a form of resistance and can include tension in a part of the body, not breathing deeply, or avoiding eye contact. Gestalt therapy is about finding and releasing those blocks. Growth disorders. This refers to emotional problems that are caused by a lack of awareness. They cause people to be unable to cope with changes in their lives successfully. Unfinished business. People with unfinished business often resent the past, making them unable to focus on the here and now. One of the major goals of Gestalt therapy is to help people work through their unfinished business and bring about closure. Dr. Carl Rogers developed a client-centered therapeutic approach, now known as person-centered therapy. 
PCT is grounded in the theoretical framework that people are intrinsically motivated to grow and develop in the direction of becoming more fully functioning when the right social environmental conditions are present. Rogers believed that people possess a directional tendency towards motivation and that there exists a capacity for self-actualization in a potentially competent individual. The underlying assumptions are that people are capable of regulating, guiding, directing, and controlling themselves provided certain conditions exist. It also assumes that a person has the capacity to understand what it is in his life that is related to his distress and anxiety. And lastly, a person has the potential to reorganize himself in such a way as not only to eliminate his distress and anxiety, but also to experience self-fulfillment and happiness. There are three core therapeutic elements that promote positive outcomes with clients. A therapist must be empathetic in their understanding of the client and his or her struggles. They must also possess unconditional positive regard for their client, and lastly, be genuine and congruent in their communication. During client-centered therapy, therapists won't focus on providing specific interventions or guidance. They provide active listening, reflection, empathy, and encouragement to talk about feelings and express belief in the participant's ability to develop positive coping strategies. Therapists address difficulties by encouraging participants to formulate their own strategies rather than prescribing intervention strategies to them. Rather, they will offer empathy, acceptance, respect, and unconditional support. This is to help a client become more self-aware and self-reliant, which then empowers them to find solutions to their own problems. When the therapist and client establish a mutual counseling contract and the therapist consistently communicates the core conditions of empathy, genuineness, and unconditional positive regard, the client's capacity to solve their own problems is released because they are no longer held back by their anxiety and doubts that block their potential. Transactional analysis was founded by Eric Bernay in the late 1950s. Bernay was passionate about the importance of engaging the client as a collaborative partner in therapy. He was also known for his purposeful use of everyday language to discuss the theoretical concepts of TA so that someone of any academic level could understand them. TA is an integrative approach to psychotherapy that incorporates a relational perspective on working with cognitive and behavioral change and the promotion of understanding and insight into the impact of early experience on current issues. The theoretical framework of TA consists of the idea that every person has three ego states that make up their personality, parent, adult, and child. The goal of TA is that every client is able to discover and understand their mental processes and defensive mechanisms. Defensive mechanisms stabilize and protect the individual, but this stability restricts their spontaneity, intimacy, and flexibility that's essential for growth. It is understanding these that they are able to let go of old protective patterns and find a new way of relating. Personality, aka ego, can manifest in three ways known as ego states. An ego state is defined as a consistent pattern of feelings and experiences directly related to a corresponding consistent pattern of behavior. Let's start by discussing the parent ego state. This state is like a repository of interjected others. This usually consists of primary caregivers and the quality of the relationships, and also from a person's cultural or social environment that is internalized during the early stages of development. This is the stage that is described as the aspect of a person's personality that was borrowed from other people. For example, If you had an overly critical parent, you may have critical or negative aspects of your personality copied from your parents or your parent figures. 
It might be that critical voice that you hear in your head um, when you have poor behaviors or you feel um, like you've done something wrong. The ego state is more about a person's feelings, behaviors, and thoughts related to the here and now. They are described by Brene as being an autonomous set of feelings, attitude, and behavior patterns which are adapted to the current reality. Lastly, the child ego state is derived from a person's history, a catalog of subjective memory systems which act as a source of regression into early experiences. Brene defines the child ego state as a set of feelings, attitudes, and behaviors which are relics of an individual's own childhood. TA is a humanistic approach that is based on ego states and transactions. Transactions are defined by a basic unit of social intercourse. There are two types of interactions, intrapersonal and interpersonal. An intrapersonal transaction is transactions that a person has with themselves. When you tell yourself you look amazing in your new outfit, you engaged in an intrapersonal inner transaction. On the other hand, an interpersonal transaction is between two or more people. When people smile at each other in passing or you call one of your cohorts for moral support, that is an interpersonal transaction. Unconscious scripts are repetitive patterns or unconscious scripts that stem from childhood. They are the early decisions made unconsciously about how life should be lived. The therapeutic change process consists of decontamination, deconfusion, and redecision. Decontamination involves the therapist and client working with the adult ego. In this process, a person may work on challenging irrational beliefs and work on cultivating an ability to be in the here and now. This process consists of mostly a cognitive process. Deconfusion is a cathartic process because it, it helps a person work on the hidden feelings or unmet needs of the inner child. This is a place where a person can make sense of their past and become aware of childhood wounds. This process involves a lot of empathetic transactions in order for it to be successful. Finally, the redecision process engages both the child and the adult. A person is encouraged to make new personal decisions and commitments regarding the way they'll live their life from now on, which is only done by letting go of the limiting script beliefs. TA has been an effective intervention for individuals struggling with depression because in processing through critical and limiting beliefs and the healing effects of the therapeutic bond, a person begins to feel more empowered and capable, reducing symptoms of depression. Humanistic theory helps individuals to become more self-actualized and reach their fullest potential, which is the goal of existential therapy. In existential therapy, one reaches their fullest potential by taking responsibility for one's freedom to choose and by accepting that their potential is bound by physical, social, and psychological contexts, as well as existential givens that one must harmonize with oneself. The core competencies of existential therapy are helping the client reach experiential awareness and to encourage change through psychotherapy. Through existential therapy, the therapist helps the client facilitate experiential awareness, which is the main impetus for human growth. The therapist helps the client with the experiential self-exploration process. The process requires a highly disciplined approach in which the psychotherapist sets aside any pre preconceived assumptions and biases in order to highlight the client's reality. Another focus of existential therapy is to use the client-therapist relationship. This relationship must be genuine in order to facilitate relational depth, and the psychotherapist must use self-disclosure skillfully and with discipline to serve the client's growth. The therapist must also practice acceptance and be willing to meet the client where they're at. The main goals of the psychotherapist in working with adults with depression are 
to assist the client to get rid of any false hope and to help the client realize their own reality, to focus on the client's current choices and work to change them, to help the client realize that they are in control of their life by the decisions they make, to search for the content of the client's internal thoughts and beliefs, and to access the deep complexities through psychotherapy. Existentialism works towards the effective treatment for the poor and minorities, which is a social work tenet. It also focuses on present experiences and is task-oriented when working with individuals and families. Existential therapy is flexible and eclectic, which works with the social work value of individuals and meeting them where they are. Existential therapy also provides a humanizing effect, which supports the dignity and worth of the individual. Now that we've reviewed humanistic theory for depression, we can review a summary and some key takeaways of this presentation. We know that depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. It affects how individuals feel, think, and behave, and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. It is a prevalent diagnosis with 17.3 million adults in the U.S. having reported one major depressive episode in 2017. With these statistics, we have to think of how social workers can show up for this population. And while there isn't a single test to determine depression, there are a number of assessments and questions asked that can help inform and guide treatment. The humanistic therapy is a positive approach to psychotherapy that focuses on a person's individual nature rather than categorizing groups of people with similar characteristics as having the same problems. Humanistic therapy looks at the whole person, not only from the therapist's view, but from the viewpoint of individuals observing their own behavior. The emphasis is on a person's positive traits and behaviors, and the ability to use their personal instincts to find wisdom, growth, healing, and fulfillment with themselves. When considering the ethical principles of social work, we don't have to look far to see that one of the values is service. Social workers' primary goal is to help people in need and to address social problems. While this is a macro statement, Social workers are trained to consider individuals, families, and groups in context of their social climate by looking at their community, environment, economic status, gender identity, racial or ethnic identity, sexual orientation, and ability. The humanistic approach encompasses the values of social work by empowering the client to inform the response of the social worker. We have covered motivational interviewing and the DEARS approach, which stands for develop discrepancy, express empathy, amplify ambivalence, roll with resistance, and support self-efficacy. We've reviewed GESALT, and the goal of GESALT therapy is to teach people to become aware of significant factors within themselves and their environment. We reviewed person-centered approach, which is key therapeutic elements for positive outcomes, genuine and congruent, unconditional positive regard, empathetic understanding, and client perception are all key factors of offering person-centered therapies. Transactional analysis is for the client to discover and understand their mental process and defensive mechanisms, teaching them to let go of old protective patterns and to find a new way of relating. And lastly, with existential therapy, facilitating experiential awareness helps the client have experiential self-exploration in that process. It's a highly disciplined process that describes and highlights client's subjective world. Overall, humanistic theory considers self-actualization, freedom to choose how one will live, and aligns with the values of social work. It is a rapidly growing body of research that shows effectiveness of human experiential therapies and has a growing appreciation 
for the holistic view of human functioning. In conclusion, the humanistic approach to therapy allows social workers to pursue social change by promoting the needs of the people they serve.